What's going on guys? Welcome to NetSec Explain. In this video, I'm going to show you how to perform cross-site scripting attacks for web app security testing. At its core, cross-site scripting is a vulnerability that allows us to modify the source code of a web page. Typically, when an attacker is exploiting a cross-site vulnerability, their goal is to execute JavaScript, because JavaScript allows to control everything in a browser. There are three categories of cross-site scripting, reflected, stored, and DOM. They all lead to the same kind of code execution, but their attack vectors are what's different. We're going to take a look at each of these in a little more detail. First, we have Reflected Cross-Site. Reflected works by taking input directly from a user and sending the request to the web server. The web server takes that input and returns the web page back to the user with the input embedded in the page. All of this is handled on the fly, and none of the injected code is stored on the server. Let's see what this looks like. We're going to be using Dam Vulnerable Web App for this demonstration, and before we get started, we're going to want to set the DVWA security setting to low. This will give us the simplest environment to work with. The first thing you want to do with any new web application you're trying to break is to get an idea of what the underlying source code looks like. This is just a simple page asking for our name. If we enter in the name Tom, it'll return Hello Tom. Seems pretty easy. We also want to point out that the address bar sets our name to show our input. You'll see why that's important in a moment. Now, to test for reflected cross-site, we want to see if we can enter in any HTML or JavaScript tags along with our name. So if we were to type in h1 tom h1, we can see that we have access to HTML tags. This is also shown in the address bar. If we look at the source code, we can see that it directly embeds the h1 tags into the HTML code itself. Let's test for JavaScript control with a simple alert box. We can copy this in, and it looks like we have JavaScript. If we look at the source code, we can also see the script tag embedded in the code like the h1s earlier. So how does an attacker get a user to run something like this? Something you may have noticed is that the input here has been put in this get request up in the address bar. Remember how I was pointing out the address bar earlier? The input is being sent to the server using a get request. All we need to do is copy this and send it off to a user. Usually, because it's from a familiar website, they'll say, Okay, this is a domain that I expect and trust. Yeah, sure, I'll click on the link. To add to it, most users will actually ignore the rest of the URL if it's long enough. Another thing we can do is put it in a URL shortener service like Bitly, so the user doesn't know what our payload is before clicking on it. Then we'll be able to redirect them to our cross-site page. What used to be popular a few years ago was actually to collect and log user session information to take over accounts. It would work like this. Visiting a cross-site page, the user would be sent to the attacker's website with their cookie information in the web request. Then the website would send the user back to the original website without the user noticing this transaction. All they'll see is the page refreshing twice and they'll be none the wiser. Or to be even more stealthier, the attacker would inject a single pixel iframe doing all of this in the background. To show you what this looks like, we'll use Google to play the part of our attacker domain. And just like that, we were able to collect a user's PHP session ID using only cross-site scripting. Now that we've seen cross-site scripting in action, let's move on and take a look at stored cross-site. Stored cross-site works just like reflected, except that the injected code is stored on the server and returned to any user that visits an infected page. Guestbooks, forms, and comment pages are typically targeted in these kinds of attacks, since user input is shared with anyone who visits those pages. Here's an example. If we visit the stored section in DVWA, we have the ability to sign the guestbook with our name and type in a comment. We can see that our comment is stored on the server, so every time we visit that page or anyone else visits that page, that comment will always be there. Okay, so let's sign it again, but with the H1 tags like we did with Reflected. View source, and we can see that also, just like last time, it's embedding the HTML tags into the code itself. Last step, test for cross-site. Throw in the test script and boom, stored cross-site. Now anyone that visits this page is going to be attacked by this script tag and have their session information stolen or be redirected to another website, whatever the attacker wants. 
Let's finish this section out by viewing the page source and seeing how the script tag is embedded in the HTML. The last type of cross-site we're going to cover is DOM cross-site scripting. DOM stands for Document Object Model, and it's a way for programmers to dynamically build and navigate HTML documents. Without getting too much into DOM itself, you'll tend to find these vulnerabilities in JavaScript code on vulnerable web pages. Think of DOM cross-site as being exactly like Reflected, except instead of sending a page request to the server to embed the code, JavaScript, already in the browser, is what embeds the injection code in the page. If any of that sounded confusing, it's not just you. DOM is one of the more complicated web vulnerabilities out there, and it's incredibly difficult to mitigate, but we'll get into that later. In the meantime, let's look at an example of DOM cross-site in action. Here we have, please choose your language, and we're given the options of English, French, Spanish, and German. By clicking through some of these options, we can see that the topmost option is being replaced with our most recent selection. Let's look at the code. We can see that this selection box is actually being built with JavaScript. Here are the options for English, French, Spanish, and German. Now, this line here explains why the top selection is being replaced by our most recent one. Whenever we make a selection, it sets this lang variable. So what if we change this variable to something else? I'm going to throw this into Sublime to make it easier to see how this works. We can imagine if we set lang to script alert hello dom, we can then replace lang in the code with our payload. While we're at it, let's strip off the document.write function, since this is just going to write the HTML as is with JavaScript variables. Format it all so that it's easier to read, and this is what that line would look like in the web page. We'll have the option tag, and in that tag, we'll have our embedded JavaScript code. Let's try it out. This is our payload, so we'll copy this and add it to the end of our last selection in the address bar. Now, I'm using NoScript on my Firefox as a way to protect myself against attacks like these. But if I allow this request, or if I didn't have NoScript installed, here's what we would get. And just like that, we were able to exploit the document object model to run our code. Like Reflected, we can copy and send what's in our address bar to a victim and take control of their browser that way. We can mine cryptocurrency, add them to a botnet, steal their credentials, anything we want. We have full script control over their browser. Now, before we move on to mitigation, I want to point something out specific to Chrome. Chrome has this feature called XSS Auditor, which tries to help limit the impact of cross-site scripting attacks. The problem is, it's difficult for browser developers to detect this sort of thing. For example, if we type in our reflected test script, we'll see that the request is stopped by XSS Auditor. But if we visit our stored cross-site page that we infected earlier, we can see that the alert pops up just fine. Oh, and one last thing. If you don't want to see the alert box every time you visit that stored section, you can reset the database in the setup page. So we've taken a look at Reflected, Stored, and DOM cross-site. Reflected talks to the server, but doesn't change its code. Stored also talks to the server and does change its code. And Reflected doesn't talk to the server at all. So how do we mitigate these kinds of vulnerabilities? First of all, it's user input. You always, always, always want to validate user input. A good rule of thumb is to expect that all user input is malicious. Whitelist if you can, but make sure as best as possible that users can only input things that your application is expecting where it's expecting it. On top of that, you also want to escape special character input. Do this for HTML, JavaScript, and anything else that a user may have access to. Escaping characters like the less than, greater than symbols to and LT and and GT will change the way they are interpreted in the browser. Also, you want to make sure that your web server is configured with the HTTP only flag set. This will tell the browser that session information should not be accessed through client side scripts. That means that even if there was a cross site vulnerability, the browser will not send cookies to a third party. There's a few more things that you can do, but to be honest, a lot of it's going to depend on your web application needs. Check out the cross-site prevention cheat sheet at OWASP.org. It'll help you out. In the meantime, that's all I have for you guys today. For more information, check out the links in the description below, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. I'll see you next time.